Good evening. Um, it looks like everybody's here on by 6.30. This is good. Um, I sent out two emails this week. One was the regular email announcing the meeting and um, that our speaker would be Deacon Greenway. The other meeting, the other message was an invitation to attend an Ananias retreat. Did everyone get the second invitation? Good. Okay. I strongly encourage you to attend. It'll be really interesting. Um, you know, we've talked about all the various forms of prayer that we do. A retreat is like going away for a weekend of prayer. So if you can attend, please contact Mary Catherine. I know today was the deadline, but let me know. You have a few days, um, you know, because the message did go out late. Uh -huh. No, it's not midnight yet. That's a good point. Thank you, Karen. Um, anyway, I strongly encourage you to go. The people that you have been meeting with as your mentors, Ananias group is the training that they've gone through. So if you, you know, relating to your uh, mentors and the conversations that you're having with them, that might give you an idea of the type of uh, meeting that we'll have. Okay, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, for tonight's meeting, I wanna make two introductions and then I'm gonna go sit down. Um, Randy Spellings is studying to, spelling, spelling, Spellings yeah. is um, studying to be a deacon. He will be ordained a deacon, hopefully this May, God willing. And so tonight he's gonna to present our prayer for us. Uh, he worked with us full time last year he just had his first grandbaby, so he's been. <laughs> he's happy. Everything they say it is. So I'll just leave it there. So he's been traveling a bit to see the new grandbaby. Um, and then our speaker tonight to discuss the Mass, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, is Deacon Don Greenway. Some of you might recognize him from church being up on the altar. Uh, Don's been a deacon for 20 years, 19 years. And um, he's, he's just great. But he's a convert. So he came here from the Methodist Church. I don't know if you're going to talk about it. So he's, he'll tell you a little bit of his story. So he has sat where you're sitting right now. So he's, he's a little bit more in your mind of knowing where you're coming from. So we're going to open with Randy with the prayer. And then Deacon Greenway will speak from there. Okay? All right. Good. All right. Thank you. So, uh, take a small tangent, uh, because uh, we introduced Don. Uh, interesting side note here, my wife Kim and Don came into the church the same year. That's how, that's when our relationship started. And so, as I was discerning the call to uh, the diaconate, I had men like Don in my life who have always been uh, just a stalwart of faith and an example to me. So Don and I go way back, and a lot of my formation is because I became friends with him. So I appreciate that, Don. So, so tonight, when we, I know over the last couple of weeks, we've been giving, introducing different types of prayer to you. And so it kind of occurs to me that it would be a good time to step back and focus exactly on kind of how we prepare ourselves to, to spend time with the Lord. Um, you know, we live in a busy, demanding world, and oftentimes it's hard to quiet ourselves. It's hard to put ourselves into that proper perspective to hear the Lord and uh, to speak to him and to hear him speak to us. And it, as we know, there's as many different types of prayers as there are personality types, and not everything uh, connects with every one of us. But guess what? God made us all. He knows how to speak to your heart. He will lead you to the right type of prayer that, for you. So tonight I want to introduce you to a, an acrostic that I have found personally helpful for me in those times when I'm having trouble getting started, right? Whenever I'm trying to, to get into that prayerful state, sometimes we just need a jump start. So the acrostic that, that has been introduced to me through the years is called ACTS. 
not from the, uh, the letter, but from the, no, the, uh, the words, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. So you should have a handout that kind of lays a little bit of that out, but what I want to do is kind of take you through a reflection. You know, close your eyes, whatever is comfortable to you, just focus on the, the handout, but just listen to the Lord speak into your heart as I take you through this reflection. If you're so inclined, write down a word or thought that enters your mind so that you can take that back with him into a deeper prayer at a later time. So again, let's start as we always do, in the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will pro proclaim your praise. O Lord, our God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things. By your will they came to be and were made. Glory to God in the highest. We praise you. We bless you. We adore you. We glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. You are God, the mighty God, the great king over all the gods. You hold in your hands the depths of the earth and the highest mountains as well. You made the sea, it belongs to you. The dry land too, for it was formed by your hands. O oh God, you are my God, for you I long. For my soul is thirsty. My body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. What is that great simple symbol of your strength and glory? The crucifix. We ponder the mystery that your word became flesh and dwelt among us. For you so loved the world that you gave us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that we who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. It is a great mystery that we cannot fully understand, but only adore. Lord, I cannot consider your greatness without also acknowledging my sinfulness, my smallness. I look back across my day, and I consider all the times and ways that I've chosen a lesser good, and I've fallen short of your glory. For the times I have sinned in my thoughts, Lord, I'm sorry. For the times I have sinned in my words, Lord, I am sorry. For the times I have sinned in what I have done, Lord, I am sorry. For the times I have sinned in what I failed to do, Lord, I'm sorry. With a humble and contrite heart, I acknowledge these failures before you who are all good and deserving of all my love. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. Oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. My offenses, truly I know them, my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done. Lord, while my sin is ever before me, I know that your merciful love is greater than my sinfulness. In spite of my shortcomings, you have blessed me in ways too numerous to count. I am thankful for the necessities of life which I take for granted. A roof over my head, food to nourish me, clean water to drink, clothes on my back, 
these you have generously provided. I'm thankful for my parents, my siblings, my spouse, my children, my extended family, and my friends. For these loving relationships through which you have loved me and shown me how to love and to serve. I'm thankful for my work, a place where I can combine my gifts and talents to create value which is shared with others. I thank you for allowing me to experience the creative process, for giving me the opportunity to be of service. I'm thankful that you placed me in this free land where I can worship you in spirit and truth without fear of punishment. This is but a short list of the blessings for which I am truly thankful. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. But more importantly, I am thankful for the gift of your son. For me and my salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. I am thankful to have his example and his church to guide me in all things. To reconcile me to the Father, he willingly suffered death through crucifixion, but he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven taking his rightful place at your right hand. I'm thankful for this great saving act, which has reconciled me and all humanity to the Father. So now we dare to call ourselves children of God, yet so we are. Lord, now I turn to the prayers of my heart. Within the world we... <coughs> Within the world, we offer up these needs for your people. Those suffering from afflictions or natural disasters. Within our country, we pray for our political leaders and the political unrest that exists. Soften our hearts and help us to treat each other in charity and with respect. We pray for those who place themselves in harm's way so that, I can, that we can live in peace and security. We pray for those less fortunate, the oppressed, the victims of violence or discrimination, the homeless, the hungry, the unemployed. Lord, within our work or our school locations, we have friends in need of your loving care and assistance. We name them now and offer their needs up to you. Lord, within our families, we also have those in need of loving care and assistance. We have relationships that need repair. We name them and offer them up now to you. Within all of our circles, we name those who are sick and suffering. We especially pray for those impacted by our current pandemic. We lift them up by name to your gracious care. Lord, for ourselves, we offer these personal intentions. We bring them from the depths of our hearts. Like the blind man, Lord, we want to see. Like the leper, Lord, we want to be made clean. Lord, we present this prayer to you. We ask you to fill our hearts with charity, enliven our faith, strengthen our hope, that we may draw closer to you each day as we strive to love and serve and honor you in all we do. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you, Don. I'm going to turn it over to you. Before I start into the formal talking about the liturgy of the Word, we've got a lot of ground to cover. But I wanted to tell you that uh, I've been a deacon for 19 years, uh, and I'm sitting where you're sit. I, I sat where you're sitting uh, back in three years before I started my training for the deacon uh, in 1994. I was 45 years old. I'd been married to a Catholic for 25 years. Uh, very happy with my Methodist faith. My wife decided she wanted to go to our CIA class to update her knowledge and understanding as there are several in here that are, are uh, wonderful Catholics already but just want to learn about it. She wanted to do that and I had three sons, fairly just middle, like young teenagers and maybe 10 or 11, I guess, went from that to early teenage years at that point in time. But I wanted to be able to teach them their Catholic faith. I had agreed from the beginning that they would be Catholic. And I was very much an involved father and, and wanted to, to be there for them and, and so they, I could teach also. So when I came in that first night to RCIA class, we had to fill out the little form, name, address, blah, blah, blah. Then the question was, do you plan to become Catholic? And I wrote on that line, absolutely not. And it only uh, took God a short time to change my mind. And so it was that next Easter when I actually came into the church. But I was still wavering up until about two weeks beforehand. But I was so in love with the Eucharist, I couldn't stand not to be able to, to receive the Eucharist. And that, you know, for me, that was the, the, it's the source and summit of my faith was the Eucharist. And it's the source... That's the source and summit of our faith. And, but we're not going to talk about that. I think Patty may have said I was into about liturgy of the Eucharist. I, that, I think she said Eucharist. So we're supposed to talk, talk about liturgy of the Word. But let me go back here and let's get started on the talk. And uh, we're going to talk actually quite a bit about what happens before we get to the Word, so to speak. Because the Mass, we begin the Mass just like Randy did tonight by making the sign of the cross, we end the Mass with the sign of the cross. So the Mass becomes the ultimate prayer from man to God and from God to man. It is the ultimate prayer where we go through all of that, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. And all of, actually all of that before we even start the, uh, the, the second half of the Mass, which is the liturgy of the Eucharist. And so I want to talk about all of that a little bit. There are some things that I remember as being a Methodist, a non-Catholic, and, and I had not been in the Catholic Church, uh, except for a few times with my wife because she was my best friend in high school. So I went to Christmas Mass with her and some things like that. And several of us did. The kids went, went together with them in the small town of Paragool. Um, but... So, so the, the one thing I, that was obvious, the first thing when you walk into a Catholic church, if you haven't been there, you go into a Methodist church or I, any of the Protestant churches, and everybody has come in and sat down and they start visiting and they talk. And you hear talking and rumbling throughout and so forth. And you come into our, our church, meaning the Catholic church, and it's like dead quiet. And you go, well, what's wrong with these people? They not care about each other? I, I had to get used to some of those things. And when I came in, believe me, the music here was just not too hot, not too good. And that was one of the biggest reasons I wasn't sure if I could come into the church or not, is because I really, and I couldn't understand why they didn't sing all the verses of the songs. <laughs> and, and so I know you've gone through that because those are all tonight, I'm not a, I'm not, this isn't a formal talk. You're here to learn. So if I say something and I use a theological term instead of a term that you would maybe understand, just raise your hand or stop me. Or if you have a question, raise your hand. And we'll just try to stop and take care of it right then if we can, if I say something that sounds unusual to you. And I've been known to say some wrong things at times. So, um, But... What I did not understand 
was the deep reverence for the presence of Christ in the Catholic Church. Now, when I say all this, you know, I really knew a lot of it by the time I had, by the time I came to RCIA class, but I still had a great ability to back my wife back into the wall with questions that she couldn't answer. So it was probably good for our marriage that we both came together and, and spent this time and learned together. I just didn't expect when I did that that I was going to be entering into full communion with the Catholic Church in less than a year. Um, and so it, it, it was a real surprise for me. Let me just talk or open this with, with a quote from Robert Barron. We're actually doing a series at Men of Faith here in this room on the Mass. And it's, we're, looking, we're watching his videos, and, and he opened this, uh, his sessions on the Mass, with this. And I wanted to just go through it because I thought it was a good, good quote. So this is a quote from Bishop Robert Barron who's one of the best homilists you can ever hear if you want to listen to him on, online. He's really good. Not, notwithstanding, we've got great priests, but I think they would even say, I suspect they listen to him sometimes too. He is, he's outstanding. Mass is a great call and a response between Christ the head and his mystical body being the church, the people. There is no more intense, privileged way to relate to him than at the Mass, a time of adoration. Ad ora, as he says, ad ora, adoration actually means mouth to mouth, connecting mouth to mouth, aligned with God. A great time of worship, a conversation with God. He speaks and we speak back, and that's what Mass is. A time when heaven and earth join together. We feel like that there are angels present in our sanctuary because we have the body of Christ actually present in the Eucharist. And when, the, when you have the body of Christ, you have angels there. And so we feel that we commune with the dead, that we pray with them, we ask them for prayers. If most of you, if you've had somebody in your family, you've prayed for them. And you probably, when you get desperate, you turn to them to pray before God for you for some reason. We feel that we pray as we go through the Mass, this being a supreme form of prayer, that we're communicating. I don't mean communicating like you here on TV. I just mean theologically in our spirits that we're in touch that they hear what we ask for. That's why we pray to saints to heal us. And we pray to Mary, we pray to Joseph, uh, all, of the, all of the saints. And the saints become all of your friends and family who have died and are in heaven. If they're in heaven, they have been, they are, they're considered a saint in heaven. And so we ask them to pray for us. We feel that we join together that the whole community of the kingdom of God comes together, joins together during a mass. It's, it's, it's something, you've got to contemplate this, you've got to think about it, give it some thought. Um, but for us, the source and summit of our Christian life is the mass. Um, the thing when you come into our church that Respect and adoration. Adoration begins the minute you walk into our sanctuary, and that's why we become quiet. Uh, God is physically present. And how do you know God is present? And when I say God, I'm referring, of course, to Jesus Christ. But I use those terms, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Uh, one, they're, they're fully one. One and three, three and one. They're fully so... I may use the terms interchangeably, I don't mean to confuse you, but they're all, they're all united as one. So it's whatever term you're using at the time may differ, it is still all about God. Um, but when you come in, there's what is the term for the candle is the sanctuary candle, and most Catholics refer to it as the red candle. Up, at, up front, it's usually beside the tabernacle on one side or the other. 
Uh, it'll, generally, it's, it's going to be behind the altar, uh, but that tells you that Jesus is physically present in the sanctuary. And that's where things change for us because our, our attention turns to him at that point. That's the reason for the silence. The first thing we do is dip our finger in the holy water, the baptismal font in the back of the church and make the sign of the cross. And at that point, we're renewing our um, baptismal promises. What are those? This is a book that we use to baptize people, babies, infants, children, adults. And one of the things in the right is that you ask the people, and obviously if it's a child or an infant, the parents and the godparents for the child. And so the questions are, do you reject Satan? And the answer, of course, is yes. And all of his works and all of his empty promises. So when you hear somebody say to you, uh, relate something in the preaching that they're talking about, this is relating to your baptismal promises, this is what they're referring to. The last three questions are, do you believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints that I just mentioned, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Those are your baptismal promises. Hopefully you answer yes to each one of those. You get the opportunity to do that at Easter. But you will hear about it at other times, believe me. It's said over and over. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll get to the creed later on that we say right after the homily at every Mass. And it says, just that's the summary of what it says in the creed. So if anybody asks you, why are you joining the church? What do you believe? It, when we get to it, that's what we believe. The creed which we, re, which we recite is what we believe. There are some other things. When I came into the church, I still didn't know what to think about purgatory, the authority of the Pope, or Mary. I knew all about it. I just wasn't sure. And they kept telling me, you don't have to believe everything. You need to know about everything, and you need to continue to search. It didn't take me six months till I bought into everything, 100%. It just, there's, when you start at that point to receive the Eucharist, it, things change. Life changes. It never will be the same. So, uh, I don't want to get on that. That's next week, but it changes everything for you. But I want you to understand, so when we come in, we get silent. We make the sign of the cross because for all Protestant churches, including the Methodists, everybody, the Trinity is the number one doctrine. The Trinity is always. So that's what we make. That the sign of the cross and the holy water is to renew our baptismal promises because you're coming into church, that's, that's what you're, you're literally doing, that you say this to yourself. And um, then, if that red candle is present, you, as you go in to the pew, you see people either genuflect or bow. And that is the reason for that. It's acknowledging the presence of Jesus Christ, physically present in there with you. Uh, the other thing, and I like this, it said, you're acknowledging that you're claimed by Jesus. When, when my family goes out to eat, we make the sign of the cross and we say the prayer before we eat. And I liked what it said here, is that we're in essence branding ourselves. Just like a cow is branded and it says who that cow belongs to, 
the sign of the cross says that I belong to Jesus Christ and to the Trinity, to God. I have, this is my faith. And I'm going to live it, and I'm going to show you I'm going to live it. Took me a while to do that. Until one of my sons said to me one day at McDonald's on Cantrell. He was about 12, 13 years old, the oldest son. And he looked at me and he said, Dad, how come we pray before we eat at home, but we don't when we go out to eat? And so... I mean, I, from that point on, I was convicted. And those are just things that kind of change your life if you're willing to, to give your life to your faith. Uh, when we enter the pew, most of us uh, immediately kneel down to pray. And, you know, our prayers are really starting. They, they, you're going to repeat this when the Mass starts, but it's good for us individually to kneel down and to start talking to Christ at that point. He's right there in front of you. And uh, it, it's a very special time. And that's why we don't like for people to talk, because people are... The point, once you're in church is to focus on your relationship with Christ. Um, and I know if, if you've got grandkids or kids, you know, and they're crawling all over the place, that's hard to do that. But that's the goal. That's what you try to do. And I even talk to men that have kids about making an effort to spend a, find a time when you can go to Mass occasionally by yourself. Because there's nothing, it's, it's very special when you can be there alone and focus on nothing but you and God or you and Christ uh, and not all the other things that are going on around you. It makes a huge difference. Everything that we do in Mass, everything that as I'm going to go through here, that we say or that we do, whether we stand, sit, kneel, make the sign of the cross, bow our heads, whatever we're doing, everything is intentional and has a purpose. There's something going on constantly. Whether it's, it, it, does, it just doesn't matter as we go through here. There's so many things. It never stops. It's continual. But in that, try to focus. The biggest thing you can do is focus on what's happening up front and what Christ is doing there with you. So Mass begins. There's the procession, led by the cross, of course, the crucifix. Um, the priest, at that point, when Mass begins, and when we call this, if you'll, you'll hear us use the term, the liturgy of the Word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, and what, you know, I, I'm not sure I knew really what liturgy Liturgy, Father, you may want to define it differently than I do, but liturgy is the public, is the, the public worship. Public worship. And there's an order to public worship. So we refer to that order of public worship as the liturgy. You, either of you have anything you'd like to add to that? An order of public worship. That's what liturgy means. That's all. But in Mass, it has a specific... There, there are do's and don'ts in what we do in the liturgy because there are some things we do. Let me give you a case. that when, <clears throat> when people bow coming up to read, it's one of my pet peeves, is a lot of people, and they, it's because they don't understand, they'll bow to Jesus in the tabernacle during the Mass when they're coming up. And I, I think the proper thing is everything is centered on the altar during the liturgy of the Mass, and the proper position to place to bow is toward the altar. We're not bowing to an altar itself. We're bowing to the fact that Christ has been presented to us there, will be presented to us there, is presented to us there, and so we bow to the altar. So if it's during Mass, you bow to the altar. If you're there at other times when you walk in, and you'll see us go up front when we enter. Where the stairs are up front is what we really refer to as the sanctuary, and the whole thing is the church. But the sanctuary would just think of from the Old Testament as the Holy of Holies. 
Christ, you know, back, if you all have, are familiar with the Old Testament, and they refer to the Holy of Holies, which is up front, and only the priest, the high priest, could go up there at that point because God was present. Well, God is present in the tabernacle. God has been present on the altar. During, during the uh, Mass, we bow to the altar. At any other time, we bow to the tabernacle where Christ is present because it's outside of liturgy. Okay? Do I have everybody confused yet? What, why are you, tell me what's confusing. What, it just, the liturgy is a formal service. Sure. And, and I'm trying to keep the difference. Yes, but the difference is Christ is always present. Christ is everywhere. He's here. He's in you. He's in me. And, I know that. I, and we know that. But he is, but he, there's a difference, and I don't want to get off on the talk, but because you'll get more about this, but he is physically present in in the Eucharist. He, the Holy Spirit has transformed that into Christ, and that's what we believe, that he is physically present because of his words. He, he became present here, and, and this is, we're really to go on and, and talk about the liturgy of the Word, and you're going to have a, an entire talk on the liturgy of the Eucharist, so you'll have more time to think about this and discuss it. It, it holds a lot of people up, but once you, it, it's a mis If Christ can be present when we say these words and we baptize a baby, and we say the Holy Spirit enters that baby, and that you've all been baptized, or no, some of you may have not been baptized. If you've been baptized, the Holy Spirit, Spirit entered you. God entered you physically. That's a sacrament. That's necessary for God to claim us before we have the ability to receive him in the other sacraments. Okay? If you've previously been baptized, you're not going to be rebaptized. We don't do that. We believe in one baptism. Okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, but all I'm saying is you have to go from that knowing God comes into me through the words of that minister and, the, and the, the, the use of water, we have been baptized, as we're told in the Bible, that we are to be baptized to receive Christ. If he can do that, then he can also do anything else in the sacraments where he's told us in Scripture that he will come to us. And that we are to, to again, I'm not talking about tonight the, the Eucharist, but it's... You have to go, we have to talk about it some because of what we do as we come into church is because of this. It's because of what we're saying that he is physically present. Okay? And so when we say the Eucharist is in the tabernacle, whatever is left over that has been consecrated by the Holy Spirit to become the body and blood of Christ it, different from some of the other Protestant churches where they believe that that becomes Christ only during the liturgy and is after the liturgy is over then he's no longer present in it. Catholics, that's what sets us apart. Once he, that has been consecrated with his, as his body and blood, it remains his body and blood until it's consumed or destroyed. So we, we treat it as if, well we treat it carefully because he is present. That's the reason for the silence. That's the reason for what the reason that we kneel. So you've got to get there to understand why we're doing all these other things. Okay? Any other? I mean, let's get it out and talk about it now if you can't because that's the beginning of the Mass and this is what we do and, and that's why we do it. Okay. So, um, at times, you also may see something else that's different is incense. And incense is right from Scripture, right out of the Old Testament, also in Revelation. 
uh, everything, everything that we do has a scriptural basis for it. So please understand that. And there are some books over there that I have for you. And this is, Gus Lloyd is a, a really neat guy that's on the Catholic Channel on XM Radio. Channel, I think it's 119, but I'm not sure. Uh, he came here and talked. He sells these books. He, he decided because the, the, it, one minute means it takes you one minute and you can answer whatever question, whatever is at the top, he'll explain it and almost everywhere he references scripture. So, so uh, a perfect example would be the, uh, uh, the altar. Here's one on the altar and he explains it for you and references scripture for you. Um, so look, take these with you and read through them uh, to help give you some, some under, better understanding of what we've said here. Because I'm, I'm going to cause some confusion, and, but this is very important that, that, again, the Mass is the focus of our faith. Uh, incense is used because it's just simply to represent the prayers rising up to God. So the entire Mass is a prayer. And so we enter, sometimes, are, are we using incense on the procession now? I think we are, are we not? Uh, we haven't been using incense for a long time. We now have new altar servers, so we're, we're training them to do incense because it is a definite part of the Mass. Uh, if you are allergic to incense, let's talk about practical things here. If you're allergic to incense, there will be one Mass each Sunday that does not use incense. Okay? And the others will, unless all the servers are fourth or fifth graders, and they don't know how to use incense, we, we don't use it, obviously. But if we have older servers, we'll be using Mass at all, all of those, I mean, we'll be using incense at all of those Masses. So we bring it, it comes in with the, with the procession, uh, and then the first thing the priest does is walk around and incense the altar. This is where the body of Christ will lay. And uh, it, like I said, it's the focal point during the Mass of where everything, the center of where everything takes place. So it's incensed and, and, and then the gospel is incensed and then the altar and the cross are incensed um, at the time of the liturgy of the Eucharist. So there's three times we use it. So there's a fair amount of incense in there. So uh, if you're allergic, you, you would want to, uh, which, which Mass is it that we're not using it? 8, 8 a.m.? Okay. Okay. So otherwise, sit in the back and because and, it, it's not going to go away. <laughs> so the first thing that we do then is after the deacon and, and the priest uh, uh, kiss the altar, we go over and the priest calls us to, at that point, acknowledge our sins. And let me just say here, this would be, again, if you haven't had the talk, this would be the venial sins or what we would say the minor sins as opposed to the mortal sin or major sin or cardinal sin is the term we use for the major sins. Uh, you, you really as a Catholic, should not take communion or receive any of the sacraments if you're in a state of mortal sin, if you've not gone to confession for something that you did. And that's a talk for another time. It would take us all night to talk about the, those differences. But just venial sins or minor sins, those are forgiven, and we're trying to get ourselves in a state so that, we're, uh, uh, that we can receive Christ's presence in his word and in his body and blood. Um, so that's the purpose. So the first thing we do is referred to as either the penitential act or the penitential rite um, is the priest will lead us in, 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 with what's called, I'm, gonna, I'm just throwing this term out so you've heard it, confidior, which is to ask God to forgive you 
and, and to ask for mercy. And we start that with the confidior, which is led by the priest. Uh, and then you'll, hear, sometimes, you'll then hear him say, uh, the deacon or a priest will say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. We repeat that afterwards. So this whole time, we're really coming to God to acknowledge his presence and then ask him to forgive us of our sins so that we're ready for the rest of the, that part of the part of, parts of the Mass that you're going to see written there, which would be the Liturgy of the Word and then the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, after that, we sing a Gloria, and that's the praise uh, that he mentioned. You can think of it as Thanksgiving, but we're praising God as his angels praise him. Glory to God in the highest and peace to people on earth. And, and so it's something you will learn but it's referred to as the Gloria. Um, and that's followed by the opening prayer, which is also referred to, and many Catholics don't know this, but it's referred to as the, the Collect. And the way to explain, the best way, I, it's a collection. You're hearing everything that's brought, that we've done so far is brought together in the prayer before we start the Liturgy of the Word, which is the next step uh, after the prayer. You'll, uh, it sort of summarizes the praise, the thanksgiving, uh, the confession, the singing, everything together. So it's referred to as the collect. So then begins what you're here for to listen to tonight. It's the liturgy of the word. That's the next step. Uh, and there was no easy way to get to that because there's, you need to understand what's happening prior to that. Uh, this is the first major section of the Mass. Uh, it's a great encounter where God speaks to us and then we respond with, with psalms or song or prayers. Uh, a lector who is a lay person, as you'll see, will walk up front. That's when I mentioned to you that, that you know, they will bow and they, they should bow to the altar. Uh, and they will do the first reading and then we do a psalm, which is always on Sunday Mass, it's always sung. On a weekday Mass, we, uh, we, um, we say it, we don't sing it. Um, and then we do a second reading, and then we'll come to the Gospel. But let's, let's back up a little bit. Please understand that as Catholics, we're a Bible church too. So we read four readings every Sunday in every Mass, in every church in the world. And on weekdays, we read three readings. The first reading on Sunday will always be an Old Testament reading because we feel like Christ is present in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. Um, we use completely different books to read from on weekdays than we do on Sundays because Sundays are divided into three different um, groups of readings that go for a year. And so we just refer to them as year A, year B, and year C. Uh, and it just rotates. ABC, 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 ABC. Weekdays are divided into two different sets of readings. So it's year one and year two. So that in a three-year cycle, if you went to every Mass every day, you would hear, and I've read various people quote, 85%, then I've read it, go down to 75%, depending on who you're reading. So you can see it somewhere between 75 and 85% of the Bible you will read at least in every chapter of a very large part of the Bible. Okay? Have I made all, is that clear? So Sunday is A, B, and C, so it's a rotation that goes on for a year. And then every year at Advent we start a new year. And so it just so it just remembers A, B, and C, and it's four readings on Sunday, an Old Testament reading, an apost then the Psalm, which is always sung on Sunday, and then an apostolic reading, and it's from the apostles, which is Paul is included in this, uh, it, it, he, and then uh, and then of course we read the Gospel from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And that will vary. But 
Every year A, it's always the same reading. So after three years, it's repetitive readings. That allows us as homilists to go back and use an old homily. No, I'm <laughs> just joking. Just joking. Uh, at the end of the reading, of the Old Testament reading, by the lector, they say the word of the, the, word of the Lord. Um, and uh, I'm blanking. The response is, uh, thanks be to God. And yeah, yeah, it's always. Um, so the psalm is always sung. Uh, we also, besides Sundays, I'm sorry, uh, we have what we call feast days. And those are special high holiday. Uh, it would be to you a holiday. It's not a holiday. It's a special like uh, for Mary, uh, for certain, uh, for the apostles. Uh, what else? For feast days. Mary and the apostles. You have a number of saints. There are a few saints. And they're called feast days. And on those we celebrate or on days of uh, 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 other spe well, yeah, but that right, Christmas and Easter, uh, but those are special days, and we'll do the Sunday liturgy on those special days. Otherwise, we follow the weekday masses for everybody else. Uh, the as I mentioned, it's important that you understand about our church being an apostolic church that why some of these things are done, like only the priests or the deacons who are the, the people that are ordained uh, will read the Gospels in our Mass. Um, the lectors read the first two readings or the first reading in the Psalm on a weekday, but the priest or the deacon always reads the Gospel. And it's referred to because we have an apostolic faith. And an apostolic faith means that Christ ordained Peter and the apostles. Peter as the, the first pope and the apostles. They literally became the first bishops. And then they ordained other bishops. Ordaining meaning by laying on of hands and declaring that they have certain powers or abilities. Um, and so bishops can actually go back and follow all the way back to the apostles, the line through which they were ordained to the apostles that were ordained by Christ. And so we refer to our faith, one of the marks, or four marks, but one, I'm not going into that, but one of them is that it's apostolic. And so that's, that's why what takes place by the, only by the priest or the deacon uh, is because they have been, we have b both been ordained by the bishop to function in our functions as, as we're allowed to do, okay? So if somebody talks to you about being an apostolic church, that's what we're referring to, and it goes all the way back to Christ. So if somebody says, who started your church? Christ started your church, and everyone since then has been ordained through his line, okay? Uh, we feel that Christ physically comes to speak to us, that we have some people who, who before we had gluten-free hosts couldn't take a host and they could either receive Christ in the wine or we could also tell them they would receive Christ fully in his word. We feel that Christ is present in his word and he's referred to as, as the word with a capital W. So he comes to us physically through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Bishop Barron, this, uh, you know, his comment was uh, that Christ is fully in person so, to, so as to speak to us. Uh, and he said, yes, by all means. The clearest and the most direct words in the scripture are from Jesus. And this is the reason that we also use incense at this time. Because we feel that he is coming to speak to us in his word. So it's, it's a special time. Um... But this thing about us reading the gospel is not a power thing. It, it really is it's based on the, the authority that we've received um, through the bishop from, from the beginning. Um, we close 
by saying the gospel of the Lord, not the word of the Lord. And again, the response is, thanks be to God. Uh, you will see us do some other things. I'm, I'm not going to cover every little thing, but uh, after we read the gospel, we kiss that book. And once again, for us, it's, it's like we kiss the altar, we kiss the book. Wherever Christ is present, we, we, clo we begin and or close with a kiss related to that as a, a, a sign of affection and authority uh, that he is who we live for. And uh, um, so next, after the reading of the gospel, is the homily. It's also done only by an ordained minister, which would be a bishop. I didn't mention earlier, I said a priest or deacon. A bishop, priest, or deacon uh, would, if the bishop is present, he is the one to kiss the book. Um, but in the homily, it's either done by a bishop, priest, or a deacon. And I'm just going to go through a list of things here about what it's not. It's not a talk by a speaker. It's not a pause in the liturgy. It's not considered a sermon in the sense that it's required to be about the readings uh, th uh, that are about the readings and gospel that have been read. Um, and this varies from the Protestant churches because I know when I was present, sometimes the priest would have a, or he would choose a, a reading of his choice to fit the topic he wanted to talk about. Um, and sometimes the readings would be about something and his talk would be about, he would get off and talk completely about something totally different. Uh, that's not supposed to happen in our church. Uh, the, the, the topic is to relate about what the readings are there to teach you about your life and what they mean, what they meant at that time and what they mean for your life. And therefore, we are to try to bring this together and sometimes the homily will only be uh, about one reading or the gospel. Sometimes it will come together because sometimes, more often than not, the first reading, the Old Testament reading, and the gospel reading come together. But there are other times when they're the exact opposites of one another, and that's how the, the homily has to be directed of looking at the differences of what was said then and what, what was said by Christ as being different. Um, the second reading uh, is, is frequently just totally out in left field and doesn't relate. The first two readings can relate. I'm, I'm just saying this for people who haven't heard it before, but sometimes through prayer and study we can see what was intended by the second reading when you might read it and think it doesn't relate to the gospel at all. So. You, you, it just takes some time with that. And uh, that's why I strongly encourage you to read the readings before you come to Mass. It will mean 100% more to you if you can do that. It, it's just to hear it quickly, read, and then to hear it preached about. You gotta really focus if you're going to follow everything that's said and why it's being said and what happened because the minister will often refer back to the readings about something that took place. If you're like me, if I paused and was out in left field or reached over to grab one of my kids and didn't hear something, it, then sometimes the homily, you're not sure where he's going and what it's about. But often, if that's the case, it's because you've not been able to listen to what was, what was in the gospel or what was in the readings. Uh, it's very important, if you can do it, to do it ahead of time. Then you have a much better feel for what's, what's, going, what's being said. Um, so my recommendations here, besides reading before you come to Mass, is it... it if you bring a small pad and take a few notes, it's really helpful to, when you leave, to talk about it or to think about it, just a few notes, or maybe even just a couple, uh, whatever the main thought you had of something that, that taught you something. And I always say, if you can leave a Mass from hearing the readings and the, and the homily 
and you hear one thing that changes your life, then in a year, you've got 52 things. And you can't tell me you're not a tremendously better person if you've absorbed 52 things during the year that was said to you. So it, it's so good to just try to focus on getting what you can, but if you get one thing, you good, don't feel, that's good, that's good. Because when I preach, if I, if I said one thing that changed somebody's life to every person out there, that would be huge. And that obviously that doesn't happen, but that would be huge. So if you get one thing every time, you've really done something very positive. Uh, and I, I just added, just yearn to grow closer to Christ in his word. That's, that's where we know him. That, and Christ is the Lord. He's God. He's, he's telling us what to do, how to live. After the, after the homily, we do the creed, which is our profession of faith. I brought the Catechism of the Catholic Church to show you how important the creed is. If anybody asks you what you believe, besides what we said earlier, if you know what's in the creed, then you know what is the basic beliefs of our church. And you know what we believe about the Trinity. And it's so important that this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, it, it tells us, this, this tells you what we believe. Everything about our faith, what we believe, is in this book. But the profession of faith is one-third of this book entirely. The entire first third is all about our profession of faith, which is our creed that we say in Mass, every, every Mass, during the, on Sunday. Uh, we, we don't say the creed, we don't say the creed on weekdays. Unless it's a feast day, yeah. Um, but it, it declares what we believe. Uh, and that's where you go back to when, when you wonder what, what we believe about this or that. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, we also use uh, and believe in, but we use the Nicene Creed. It's really the Nicene Constantinople, Constantin, Con, Constantinopolitan Creed, and there's a reason we don't use the second part of that because I still can't say it after saying it a thousand times. Um, it's based on the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, all, all of the uh, uh, councils that were held in the Catholic Church are basically held because there was a problem in the church and uh, a, a, a heresy had occurred. And so they met in these councils to sort of, to what I would call straighten out what was taking place and what was being argued about. The first one was the Council of Nicaea. And so that's what our creed is, the Nicene Creed, because it declared that the relationship between the Father and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit. The, Con the Con Constantinople Creed that was in 381, I believe, uh, just added about, all it added was about the Holy Spirit and how it, it uh, comes from both the Father and the Son. Um, but that's, that is our belief, so that's why we say it every, uh, uh, at church. After the creed, then, as, as Randy said at the, in prayer, you end with supplication, so we end with what we call petitions or prayers to the faithful. And those are prayers that are uh, said that we offer for the church, for the world, the needy, the sick, um, and, we, and for the assembly, those present in the, in the church, and for those who have died. And I think something important to hear, uh, two things. If you ever want to be on that, you have to call the church, or if you want somebody in your family that's in the hospital, seriously ill, to be on the prayers to the faithful, you have to, take, you have to call the church office to see that that happens. We can't just oh, so-and-so's in the hospital, we need to put her on the list. Well, some people are very private about their illnesses and sicknesses and, and don't want to be uh, 
want things to be known publicly. But we usually have a very long list. In fact, it's so long now, it's printed in a bulletin instead of reading it. We used to read everybody on that list, and it took a while. Now we put them in the bulletin, and we usually mention the new people that are on the list when we actually say their names during the prayers to the faithful. Uh, but it's important to us, and I think what this says for me is this exercises the priestly office of all the baptized. And uh, that's an important thing for you to understand when, when, as a deacon, I read those. I'm reading them for you. So it's important to listen to what's being read, to what we're asking God for, because we're asking it on behalf of all of you. You know, anything that we do up front, when the priest prays, he is praying for all of you. Not just, he's not just talking to God. He's praying for everyone there. He, he acts as our a representative, so to speak, in speaking to God. When the deacon offers these prayers, he's praying them for you. Uh, so they're a very important part of our Mass. Um, and it's important to those people in the hospital and the people who are seriously ill and the families who have had one, their family members to die to know the church is praying for them. It makes a big difference. And we certainly believe in the power of prayer as, as offered from the entire group. Okay? The scripture says the power, the, the uh, power of a righteous, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful. And I think that's pretty much right out of scripture. So we need to, we need to live that, and that's what our church tries to do. And this brings us to the end of the liturgy of the word. When the prayers of the faithful are over, uh, we put the book down and start to prepare the altar and move into the liturgy of the Eucharist, which you'll talk about next week. <laughs>